Welcome to Indie Publishing 101. I'm John Brown, and every time I give a presentation to new authors about indie publishing, it reminds me of this, right? There's Tevya. Dear Lord, you made many, many unpublished writers, because there's no shame in being unpublished, but there's no great honor either. So what would have been so terrible if I had one small best-selling series? If I were published. And on we would go. Now, if I was in a with a live audience, I would actually sing if I were published. But I'm not going to do that here. I think it's just I, I think it's just important to recognize that we all would love to create stories and have Tens of thousands of readers enjoy them across the world. Heck, we would love to just have hundreds of readers enjoy them, right? The, the question is, should you go indie? Is that the way to go out and, and find those readers? Well, I want to tell you about how I got into the indie publishing business, the self-publishing business. I was in between books with Tor Books. I'd sold a three-book deal to them and I'd written the first one and they were looking at the second one and they were taking their time and I had this other book that I uh, this concept that I just absolutely loved and I wanted to publish it and it was not an epic fantasy which is what I'd sold it to her. it was a thriller contemporary action thriller so I went to my agent and I said hey uh, what do you think I mean uh, let's not be pie in the sky let's not be unrealistic what's a realistic number for an advance for a new author in the thriller genre, what, what do you think if they liked it, what do you think I would be able to get? And she came back and she said, well, probably $15,000. You might be able to get a $30,000 advance if, if they really liked it. Maybe they'd give you a couple of book deal, right? Two or three book deal. So I started looking at the math and thinking about this. These are the royalty rates that publishers traditionally give on the various formats of the book. Now, you know, some contracts give you more, some contracts give you less, but th this is pretty much in the area. Here's what you get from an indie sale. And and here's where we do the math over here on the right-hand side. So I want you to look, you know, in the first column, I've got the the method of publishing or the, the, the type of book it is. In the middle column is the price. And over on the, the far column on the right is how many units would I have to sell to make that much money? So to make $1,000, if I was going to publish a, a, a paperback traditionally with a traditional publisher, we'd have to sell around uh, 1,250 of those for me, John Brown, to make that $1,000 at, at a price of $10, right? And you can see the numbers there. So 571 for a, an ebook through a publisher, 400 for a hardback. I started looking down here. And I thought, gee whiz, I could sell a book at $3.99, about four bucks, and I'd only have to sell 364 of those to make a thousand bucks. And I, I thought long and hard about this. And I told my agent, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to give this a shot on my own. I think I can do that $15,000. Now, with a publisher, a traditional publisher, they'll give you an advance, and then you have to sell books. Uh, you know, sell enough books to earn out that advance, and then you'll earn beyond that. But I thought, and and many of the advances that that these publishers give give you, they they're budgeted and they're structured in such a way that you know you don't earn them out, right? Many authors don't earn out their advances. Uh, but I I didn't want to do that, right? I I thought I want to earn out my advance, and then I want more. And if I were to go with a traditional publisher, I'd be uh, licensing them the rights. And they would have them for many, many, many years. What did? What do I think I could do in one, two, three years? Could I? Could I make up that fifteen thousand? Well, I decided that I would go indie, and I told my agent that. This is the book that I released. It's an action thriller, and uh, I I sent it out right. I published it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, etc. And the response was awesome. Let me just show you some of the reviews just to show you how this can generate, right? 
I couldn't put the book down. I was on the edge of my seat the whole book. I need a nap now. I couldn't put it down. Could not put it down. Hard to put down. I did not put it down. Couldn't put it down. Could not put the Kindle down, right? Very difficult to put down. You'd best find a comfortable chair when you start because you won't get up until you're finished. Couldn't put it down. Could hardly wait to go to the next page. Could not put this book down. Dang you, John Brown. The last half of this book was so good that I stayed up until midnight last night to finish it when I had to be up at 0400 this morning. Obviously a military guy, right? Trouble putting it down. A book I couldn't put down. And then this one, <laughs> five stars, please, Lord, don't let Tom Cruise play this character. So the book got a great response. And I blew past that $15,000, that advance. I blew past the $30,000. I, you know, in those first years, it sold over 70,000 copies. That was an indie published book. That was an indie published book. Now, I don't have anything against traditional publishing. I don't have any ax to grind. I think traditional publishing can be good if the contract is good. Heck, this this week, Bain Books published a collaboration that I wrote with New York Times bestselling author Larry Correa. It's a science fiction action adventure. They just published it. It was terrific working with Bain. It was a good contract. I loved working with Larry. And that's out there now and gaining readers. So I have no problem with traditional publishing. But I have found that it's very lucrative and rewarding to also publish in the indie market. Okay? Now, when I bring that up, sometimes I have some new writers that say, well, there's a stigma. You know, you couldn't do it on your own. You, you couldn't do it with, uh, you know, with the publisher. So you did it on your own. Let me ask you something here. And when I have a live audience, I have them raise their hands. But I want you to look at these five covers. And I want you to just try to figure out which one or which ones actually are, are traditionally published. Which ones are the self-published ones? And which ones are the traditionally published ones? Do you think you know what it is? Well, here's the answer. A little trick question. These are all indie published. These are all indie published. And furthermore, these are gaining readers, right? Gaining readers, pleasing readers. And that really is, for me, the bottom line. Who cares if I've got a certain little logo on the spine of my book? I don't care. That's not what I find rewarding. What I find rewarding is selling books and making money and selling books and, and having readers enjoy them. When I've got tens of thousands of readers across the world enjoying my books, well, that's pretty dang rewarding. And I would rather have that any day over a little logo on the back of my book. And indie publishing makes this possible. In fact, I want you to look at this statistic here. Now, this comes from the Codex Book Group, and this is a couple years old. So it's probably a little bit higher than this. Over 66% of book sales are made online through the online stores, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, etc. Back in the day, you had to go through a traditional publisher. Uh, you couldn't get into the bookstores if you didn't. I mean, not realistically, because the book seller, the book buyers didn't want to hear from tens of thousands of authors schlepping their books on their door. They didn't want to hear from us, right? And, and we didn't have the money anyway for the distribution. But that all changed when Amazon came out with the Kindle and Barnes & Noble came out with the Nook, et cetera. Now, anybody can publish. And I know, you know, A, it's one thing to publish your book, which is easy. Anybody can do it. And it's another thing to actually have your book read. There are millions of books that were published that have been published indie style, and they sank immediately into oblivion. So we don't care about getting in the store. Well, and I don't care about getting in the bookstore either. Barnes & Noble, uh, what was then Borders, Books A Million, whoever it is, I don't care about getting in that store either. What I care about is selling books to readers, having readers enjoy those books and coming back to do it all over again. That's what I care about, okay? And you can do that with indie publishing. Now, uh, uh, of course, like I said, it's one thing to be published. It's another to be read. 
And those that are succeeding know and are doing some things that others aren't yet, okay? And what we want to do in this presentation is share those key things with you. So let's get to it. The first thing is that there are no guarantees in this business. There's no super secret marketing method that's going to guarantee you readers. There's no super secret plot that's going to guarantee you readers. There's no secret, super secret group of people that if you just are in with them, you're going to have readers. You're going to have success. There, there isn't anything like that. Okay. But there are things that you can do that will increase your odds. This is the first way of looking at this that's incredibly important. Because when you look at it this way, you're like, well, I'll do what I can do. And I know that I can't control everything. But when my opportunities come along, and I'll wait for them patiently, I'll be diligent. This might take me, uh, you know, I might find success very quickly. It might take a few years. It's okay. I know that's not a reflection on me. I know that there are no guarantees. All I can do is increase my odds, right? And we're going to talk now about a number of those things that will help you increase your odds. So what are they? Well, the first one is this. You have to recognize that this is a business. I know we love, we love to read our stories. We love to write our stories. And just thinking about those stories, but, but it really is a business. We're providing a service to our customers, and that has a number of implications. Let's talk about those. Here's the very first. The hardest way, the hardest way to get a business off the ground is, is to create something that you've got to go around and convince people that they want. The best way to form a business is to create something that people already want or need, right? You're going to create something that some other human already wants. It's like this puzzle piece here, right? Customer has a certain desire and the book delivers it. It's a fit. That's what you're trying to do. And so then the question is, well, well what is it that the customer wants? What is it? And in my other presentation for the conference, I asked this question. I'm going to ask it to you. What is a story? What is this thing that we're giving to the reader? And, and sometimes you'll hear when I ask this question, we'll get the answer. Well, it's a character with the goal, you know, maybe facing some obstacles. And the answer is, well, no, that's not a story. And somebody else might say, well, it's a character in a setting with a plot. No, that's not a story. That's like saying butter, sugar, flour is a cake. It, it just isn't right? So what is a story? And this is fundamental. If you don't know, if you don't know what you're trying to deliver to the reader, it's like being in a, a huge room with thousands of mechanical parts, and you don't know if you're building an airplane, a submarine, or a go-kart. It's going to be really hard to figure out what you need to build, what to do with all those different parts. You've got to know this. What is a story? This is fundamental to everything you're doing in your business. No business goes out and goes, well, I don't know really what we're trying to, to do, uh, what we're trying to sell. You know, I don't know. We're just selling stuff. Nobody does that. So you've got to understand what is it. Now, let me ask the question in a different way. Why do you stay up late at night, especially when you got to get up the next morning? Why do you stay up late at night reading a story? Why do you? plunk down over the course of a year, hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars for your books? Or why do you spend so much time with this? Why do you sequester yourself in the bathroom, sitting on the tub, getting a weird bum? When I ask the question that way, people begin to respond and say, well, well, it's, you know, it's, it's the things that it makes you feel. It's the experience. And there's our answer. This is so fundamental to what we're doing. And so many new writers don't understand this. This answer isn't tripping off their tongue the, the moment I ask the question. And if it wasn't tripping off your tongue, hey, that's where you need to start, okay? So a story is a guided 
experience. That's what it is. It's kind of like a roller coaster. It's like those amusement park rides. It's a guided experience. And when you're thinking about this, you should think about your genre. A romance has a certain type of experience that it's giving to the reader. A horror story is another type of experience. The, our customers are coming to us n not to buy character setting and plot. They don't care about character setting and plot. They care about the experience. That's what they care about. Everything that we focus on should be related to that experience. A lot of new writers get lost in writing rules. And they have this, and I, and I know I was there once, right? Where you just feel like, oh, I gotta learn all the rules, gotta learn all the rules, gotta learn all the rules. Well, I'm gonna tell you here, right now, there, there are no rules in writing. There is only the experience. And either what you're doing is uh, 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 generating that experience or it's undermining it. That's all you really need to care about. Am I giving them the experience that, that I've promised them or not? Does what I'm doing help with that experience or does it not? That's where we should focus, okay? I love this quote by Dwight V. Swain where he talks about this, right? And, and Swain uh, uh, has this wonderful book called The Techniques of the Selling Writer and it's been selling for decades because it's so good. But let me, let me just read this to you because I think it captures what we're talking about here. The thing character wants, the danger that threatens fulfillment of this desire, and the decision he makes determine what specific readers will enjoy the story. One likes sex and violence, another tenderness and love, another the competitive striving for success, another intellectual stimulation. Relatively few college professors are Tarzan fans and even fewer sharecroppers succumb to Finnegan's wake. The trick for the writer is merely to pinpoint audience taste, then to refrain from attempting to inflect his copy on the wrong people. Let's look at this one. This is by Thomas McCormick. He was the editorial director and CEO of St. Martin's Press, right? And he wrote this book called The Fiction Editor, The Novel, and The Novelist for his editors to talk to them about this, this very topic that we're talking about and how to edit, right? So here, here's what he says. No matter who the writer, his ideal intended audience is only a small fraction of all the living readers. Name the most widely read authors you can think of, from Shakespeare, Austin, and Dickens, to Robert Waller, Stephen King, and J.K. Rowling. And the immense majority of book buyers out there actively decline to read them. The second insight, the first insight was there are no guarantees, but there are things that you can do to increase your odds. The second insight is that this is a business and, the, and one of the main implications of that is I need to give, uh, I need to build something that people already want, right? I need to build something that people already want the thing that they want in this business, in this industry that we're talking about here, is a guided experience. And by the way, that isn't the same experience over and over again, because then that would mean, mean I'd be reading the same book over and over and over again. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the same type of experience, but it's different because the details are different and, and, the, and the way that it develops is, is slightly different. So it's the same type of experience, the same type of maybe situations or characters, et cetera, but it's, but it's different, all right? And the key idea that we're getting from these two quotes is we don't have to please everybody. Most people didn't read, didn't want to read J.K. Rowling. She was, she's, she's living on gold bricks and most readers didn't pick her up. You don't have to try to appeal to everybody. You want to target your small market, whatever that is, your, your part of the broader readership. And you want to think, like I said before, in genre. This is what successful indie authors are doing. Okay? So how do you go about learning what they want? Well, here's what you do. It's pretty straightforward. Go get three to ten books in the genre that you want to write in. Okay, 
And then you want to look at those books, at the types of moments that you've got to have in those books. So, so for example, with romance, you got to have a happily ever after ending. That just has to happen, or it's not going to satisfy those readers. Okay, so there are must-have moments like that. There are other moments that they really like. There are types of beginnings and types of endings, and the type of how, the 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 kind of way that it progresses and pace, and the types of characters and story problems. You want to understand what types of uh, what type of experience that those readers want. And you, by the way, are the first reader. You want to you want to delve into a genre that you absolutely love. And so really all you got to ask is what is the great stuff that I enjoy in epic fantasy adventure or contemporary fantasy or paranormal fantasy or space opera or whatever it is that you want to write. What is it that I love in these books here that are my exemplars in this genre? What do I love? Right? And what could I add to it? What could it what is there something there that is missing? that I would love to add. So the way that creativity works is this. We see somebody else do something. And then we think, oh, man, I'd love to do that. and Or, or I'd love to do that with just a little bit of a twist. Okay? Th that's how creativity happens. I would love to do that with just maybe a little bit of a twist. And we improvise those twists. So you're the first reader. You know exactly what should be in this genre. But, but maybe you haven't made it explicit. It's still kind of tacit. And what you're doing here is making that explicit. And then you can add your improvisations to that so that what they get from you is the same type of experience. It's just a little bit different. It's your different. Okay. And that last thing there, the rule of cool, let me just explain that. That is, you're looking for things that are awesome. That's what you're doing. Don't follow writing rules. Don't, don't let anybody else tell you. Uh, the rules of what you should include. You have to follow your zinc. And so you say, here's the type of experience. Boy, this is what is really um, uh, creating a lot of electricity for me. And you follow that. You do your own improvisation to that same type of an experience. Okay. The authors, in fact, there are books out there. Chris Fox wrote Run. It's, it's a it's a big thing now in the indie publishing world, and that's right to market. You're learning what the market wants, what it already wants, right? And then you're going to provide your own little twist on that. So you're not trying to convince people to come buy your book, that they want what you have. You're just saying, hey, this is what you already love. Come try mine, okay? Now, uh, there is a fundamental core part of the experience in commercial fiction. And I call it trigger, build, and deliver. I don't have time to get into it here. I did a whole presentation on that. Um, but I, I haven't found a book anywhere that talks about that. So I wrote my own. Trigger, build, deliver, and the story setup, and how you get that core experience going. It's so core, it tells you where you'll start your story, where you stop it, and how it builds in between. So if you want more insight on this, let me recommend this book here, okay? Now, here's number three. You will increase your odds if you write series. Here's, you know, very famous Louis L'Amour series. And by the way, these books were all averaging around 53, 54,000 words. Uh, I'm going to come back to that point in just a second. Why is it that series increase your odds? Well, folks, this is a repeat sales business, right? We're going to deliver a book, and then we got to deliver another book that's the same type of experience, but a little bit different. And then we're going to deliver another one that's the same type of experience, but yet a little bit different, right? We're, we're having to sell people again and again and again. And it is so much easier to sell to existing customers, customers that have already bought into the series. It's so much easier to sell them the next book and the next book and the next book than it is to go get a, a whole new reader for a whole new world, a whole new situation. Okay, now there are authors that are doing that. Dean Koontz, he has some series. He has lots of standalones. He's delivering the same type of experience, but they're different. 
But I'm telling you right now, what we're finding is that you can increase the odds of success by writing in a series. And shorter is fine. Shorter books are fine. There are lots of people that are writing 30, 40, 50,000 word novels in a series and getting great readership and selling an experience over and over and over and over again. You can write longer, that's fine, but you don't have to. So let's say you wanna write epic fantasy and you're looking at Brandon Sanderson's big old 400,000 word behemoths, right? Which are basically four novels or three novels all packed into one. You could do that and try to sell it, but you'll be limited because your price, really the upward price on things like that from indie authors is probably $5.99. Six ninety nine, maybe if you're established, you want to sell it at three ninety nine or four ninety nine, right? How can you do that? With when you write a four hundred thousand word book, that's a long time, and you're only getting four ninety nine per sale. Well, break it up. You know, if you think about Avatar: The Last Airbender, they told a big old long story. You know, it was animation, but they told a big old long fantasy story over many, 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 many episodes. The same thing happens with The Expanse or Star Trek. We can have a huge story, long story arcs, and TV proves this, right? TV proves this with a whole bunch of shorter stories. That helps your reader because you're able to produce them quicker, and so they get goodies more frequently, and they love that, and it helps you. You can settle the lower price point and and actually they'll make more money because you're selling you're selling book after book after book. So you can increase your odds with a series. Let's go to the next one. Uh, here's Annie Belay, right? And the one type of series that, that you can think about is book two builds on book one and book three builds on book two. And that's what this is. And Annie released this. She did exactly what we're talking about here. She looked at what is it that I love? What was it that people love in this genre? And she stuffed it all in there and did incredibly well, right? Incredibly well with this series. Here's another way to go about it. Here's L.L. Muir. She's a local author. And she had this idea for time travel romance, Scottish time travel romance. And instead of it being book one builds on book two, builds on book three, they're, they're separate, right? You can read any one of them and get into the series. And when I talk about series, I don't mean just three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or 10 or 20 or 30. They've got a series that is over 50 books long now, right? It's like goosebumps with the just, just tons and tons, dozens and dozens of stories or Nancy Drew or something like that. That model works and it increases your odds for success. Here's number four, and that is to follow Pareto's law. Pareto, Villafred Pareto is an Italian economist and engineer in the 1800s. And he did this survey of all the property in Italy. And what he found was interesting. 20% of the land owner, owners owned 80% of the land. 20% of the landowners owned 80% of the land. And then he started looking in other areas and started finding this, this kind of distribution. And of course, we found that now all over the place. For example, a, a small fraction of the parts of a car cause most of the repair issues. A small number of salespeople make most of the sales. Basically, the idea is that there are a few things that have huge bang for the buck. And if you focus on those things, you're going to get most of the effect, okay? And that's the same thing with writing. There are things that we can focus on here where we'll just be wasting our time. They really don't move us down the field very far. And there are other things that if we focus on them, a few things, boy, we get a huge effect out of that. So what are these things, right? Well, first of all, you're a business. And, and if we simplify everything down, there are three things that you need to focus on. You got to focus on production, and then you got to focus on getting that product, that book out, out to the world, distributing it, and then you got to focus on making sure people know about it. So marketing, right? Those are the three things you focus on. So how does the 80-20 rule apply to this? Well, this is how it applies, especially when you're beginning. You want to focus 90% of your time 
on producing stories. And then the other percent of the time, you can focus on distribution and marketing. Now, these aren't exact numbers, right? It, this is, I'm giving you a general rule. But if I had 10 hours to write a week, I would spend nine of those hours writing. And why do I say that? Here's, here's why. This is a repeat sales business. You're not going to sell one book. The odds of you selling one book and making a quadrillion dollars are very, very, very small. That's a massive home run. You're more likely to have success with base hits and doubles, right? If you sell one book and, and then you sell another one and another one and another one, and now you've got 20 books, 30 books, and you're able to get a reader into your world and love your world, and now you can sell them the next book and the next book and the next book and the next book. And you won't have a next book and a next book and a next book and a next book if you don't produce. The other thing about consistent production is you just get better and better and better. So if your first novel isn't so good and your second one isn't so good, it's better but not good enough really to get a following. And your third one is and your fourth one, boy, that's better. And your fifth one, man, now we're cooking, right? You've gone through that because you're doing consistent production. Who am I talking about here, right? This is Brandon Sanderson. His first books, his first books didn't sell. It was his fifth or sixth. And by the time he sold that, he had written his 11th, okay? Um, he had been doing these things that make the odds of success go up. Do you want to allocate your time? in this way. If you've got 20 hours a week, well, gee whiz, right? Spend 18 of it, 17 of it, 16 of it. Spend that writing and then allocate that other time to distribution and marketing. You want product coming out of the door. It is so much easier to make a, a six-figure income or a seven-figure income when you have 60 books out there that you can sell versus one or two or three. Here's another application of the 80-20 rule to formatting. So you've written your story in Word or, or whatever it is, Scrivener, whatever it is, whatever program you use to do your writing. Now you got to get it into EPUB or the Kindle format, which is Moby. How do you get it into the ebook format and the paperback format? Well, you could take a lot of time when we were first starting. Man, I, I spent a lot of time with InDesign. I spent hours. And it would take me hours and hours and hours to format my book. I had friends that would uh, would strip all the text out, all everything out, and then they would put in the codes themselves through the whole book, right? Hours and hours and hours. Now, you can get your ebook formatted with a program called Vellum in 20 minutes, 15 minutes. It's that fast. If it were me and I were starting out again, I would just get Vellum. That's what I use right now. It's not, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles. You can't do everything in the world that you might be able to do with another program. But I want to do the 80-20 focus, right? I want to focus most of my time on consistent production. Vellum is great. Same thing with my paperbacks. I can put my paperbacks in Vellum and have them formatted in almost no time. Now, somebody might say, well, well wait a minute. There's, there's a widow over there and there's an orphan and the words are spaced just a little bit too, too, too much here on this line. Do you know what? Do you know what? What I have found is that readers don't see most of that. Book editors do and professional book formatters do, but the reader doesn't see a lot of that. And if you have the right size of book, most of that goes away versus the right font. Most of it goes away. 20 minutes. Boom. You got an ebook. 20 minutes. Boom. You got your paperback. And then you can spend the rest of the time on consistent production. Let's look at the 80-20 with distribution. There are a lot of places where you can publish your book, iTunes, Barnes & Noble, etc. When you're first starting out, don't try to do everything all at once. Don't overwhelm yourself. You want to be focusing on consistent production. So get yourself in Amazon. Start there. Maybe you'll just focus on Kindle Unlimited and be exclusively in Amazon for a little while. That's okay. Later, you can go wide. Remember, 80-20. Your job is to produce consistently. That's the number one thing that you've got to do. So go into Amazon and then branch out from there. Now let's look at marketing for a second. What is the essence of marketing? It has three parts to it. You need to attract the attention of your customer to get them stopped. Then you got to make an offer to them. 
you know, here, here's what I'm offering to you, right? And then you, you got to make a call to action and say, hey, buy my book. Th that is marketing. And adver don't get worried about the difference between what's advertising versus marketing. Just lump it all together. These are the three things you've got to do. Now, I have an asterisk there next to the first one. What am I talking about? Why do I have an asterisk there? We talked about this before. You want to attract the attention of those already looking for what you've got. You want to call to them and have them get excited. Everybody else you can put to sleep, right? If you're selling epic fantasy, you want to talk to the epic fantasy person. Your offer, everything that you do needs to be, boy, epic fantasy, epic fantasy, epic fantasy. If all the thriller readers and all the bromance readers are like, oh, yawn, that's fine. Because you don't care about them. You're not selling to them. So how do you go about doing this marketing? What's the 80-20 in marketing? This is what you've got to have. And this is what you can work on in that hour, two hours a week that you can allot while you're spending most of the time on consistent production. The first thing you need to get are the five elements of your offer. I'll explain what that is in here in just a second. You got to make sure that you have a sales page. Once you publish it, it goes up on a sales page. Now that could be on your website, but normally you're just going to start at Amazon, right? You want to have links in your books in the uh, back matter and front matter. We'll talk about that. You want to have an email list. You want to start building that. It might be a little baby, baby, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 people on your email list. That's fine. You just want to start building that. Your email list is gold. And you probably need a static website. Okay? Those are the things that you need. There are lots. Notice I didn't put here paid advertising. Yeah, there you can do paid advertising. But this is what you want to focus on because this brings the biggest bang for the buck. If, you've, if you only have a limited amount of time, do this first. Later, you can look at that other stuff. Do one of these things at a time. Don't overwhelm yourself. Just take one at a time. So let's look at what I'm talking about with the big five elements of your offer. And you can see them listed below. So here's a sales page out on Amazon for one of my books. I want you to look at that cover. Remember I said that we're, we're talking to... We're calling out like a bird into the forest. Caw! We're calling out one song. And what we want is to put everybody else asleep. And we want the people that are looking for that to go, Caw! Caw! right? Oh, my gosh. There's somebody like me. There's somebody offering what I want. Okay? Does that, does that cover scream action thriller? I, uh, it, it does, right? That cover was designed... The colors, everything about it was designed for action thriller. I even put thriller on the front so to make sure that there wasn't any um, confusion. Okay, So the very first part of your offer is the cover. The cover is screaming out to the reader, here's the experience that you're going to have. The genre is a shorthand for the experience. Here's the experience you're going to have with this book. I'm offering this type of an experience to you. It's going to be action thriller. That's why you want your fantasy, epic fantasy books to look epic fantasy because that's telling the reader, ooh, look at this great experience you're going to have over here. Your romance covers, you want them to say romance. There's the first thing. There's my tagline, right? He could have looked the other way, but Frank Shaw isn't that kind of guy. So you've got to have some kind of tagline to grab their attention. That's what we're doing. And then we've got a description. And of course, there, there are principles of, of writing a description that help the reader understand and start getting them to anticipate this experience that they already want. They already love action thrillers, and this should help uh, uh, trigger that response in them. The next thing is proof that this is going to be good. People don't want to risk their time or their money on something that's going to be a little, uh, I don't know, if it's a crappy book, I don't, I don't want to have to buy a crappy book. So the great thing about Amazon's book page is you get to look inside and, and have a sample, kind of like what you do at, at Costco, right, when you're taking a, a bite of various samples. I've got ratings there, customer reviews that give people confidence, and maybe there are some blurbs. And then the, the last thing, of course, is the price. And you want to price appropriate for your genre. That's the very first stuff that you want to get. Your cover is your most important marketing element, right? And, and you might even add title to that as well. This sales page right here, this is, this is it. This is the number one thing. If you could only do one thing, you would want this sales page 
this offer to be great, okay? And then of course, everything that you have, anything else that you're doing, all leads people to the sales page because that's where the offer is being made to them and that's where they're getting the call to action to buy. So whatever you're doing, it funnels them here and then they can see it, they can get triggered for and the anticipation is triggered for the experience that they want and they say, oh my gosh, I gotta have it, click, okay? You want to make your pages easy to find. Part of building that page is to make sure that in your descriptions and your taglines and your titles and in the metadata underneath, you're using the relevant keywords that match up with the experience that you want to give people so that people that want that can find it. Okay. And then there are relevant categories. By categories, I'm talking about these categories that you see over here on the left. Right. And oh, by the way, when I took this picture, guess what? Uh, top 10 in Epic Fantasy, top 10 sellers, those those four there are indie authors. Stigma, schmigma, that's what I say. The next thing are the links in the books. And this is one from a seven-figure author, meaning she's making a million dollars a year. At the very end of her book, right there, there's the last line. Yes, she kissed him again, and yes. Boom, there's a link to leave a review, helping build her sales page. Boom, there's a link to join her email list. Email lists are gold, right? Boom, there's a link to buy the next book, right? All of these things that we want our readers doing. Leave a review, join my list so that I can get in contact with you and let you know when more goodness is available, right? Or go buy the next book. She also has, right, right as you turn the next page, she says sneak peek, right? So if you don't click any of those links, you turn the page, Sneak peek, here's here's the chapter one of the next book. And you read page, 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 page. And then here's the end of chapter one. And boom, there's a link. Go out and buy it. Go out and buy it, right? There's a call to action. Go out and buy it. So links and books, this is what we're talking about. And you're not going to be able to use this marketing method until you have books, right? So again, 90-10, you got to be focusing on consistent production. And then finally, your email list, you'll have call to action links in the books. You'll have call to action links from your website. You might create a reader magnet, which is maybe a short story or a novella directly tied, directly related to your series, the best selling series that you have or, or the series you want to promote. And then you offer that to people for free for joining your email list. So you get all these people that are excited about your stuff, your books, you give them a free reader magnet and they join the list. And then of course, in your email list, um, you wanna send it out on a regular basis, monthly, bi-weekly. If you've got a lot to sell, a lot of books to promote, you could do it twice a week, right? But in the beginning, don't overwhelm yourself once a month, twice a month, and then you're gonna provide them value. Things that they as readers are interested in. And uh, that's a whole other topic there. We don't have time for it today, but but that's a whole other topic. Uh, this book here is terrific. It's by Elena Johnson. She is local to Utah. She makes a million dollars plus every year in her indie publishing business. This woman has tons of great insights. And to learn more about marketing systems and how to approach this, boy, um, I can't think of a better book. So let me recommend that one to you, Writing and Marketing Systems by Elena Johnson. Okay, this is the last tip. This is the last thing that those who are succeeding know and do that to others that don't might not. And that is you just gotta be patient and diligent. Patient and diligent. You gotta work at it, work at it, work at it. You, you cannot control when things will take off. I know an author, he's a horror author. He's been writing for years, more than, gee whiz, decades. And just this year, his 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 business just went crazy, okay? It just went crazy. He, is, he has been patient and diligent, focusing on consistent production, focusing on delivering the experience, the type of experience these readers want, putting out book after book after book so he can generate repeat sales. That's the last tip. Be patient and diligent and nice to yourself. Just have a fun time. So let me summarize here what we're learning about how to increase your odds. You want to select a genre 
and then you want to deliver the type of experience for your genre that those people that go to that genre for. You want to deliver that as often as you can. If it's only once a year, okay, that's what you can do. If you can do twice a year, great. Three times a year, great. Four times a year, even better. If you can write a book a month and there are authors that can, terrific. Do it, right? Deliver often. It's better. It's easier in a series. It's not saying that it can't be done if it's not in a series, but it's easier. Uh, it increases your odds if you do it in a series. Make sure you got the right price. Get great covers. Right, that's that part of that first thing that that uh, the offer, one of the big five in the offer. Get a great tagline and description. Make sure you use the links in your books. Those are the readers that when they get to the end of your book, they actually like your book and they're going to click on it. Those are your people, right? You you've got to have links in your books, and then you want to have your email list of fans. Those are the things, right, that we're talking about here that you want to focus on. So with that, we'll end, and I'll just say this, that indie publishing can be incredibly rewarding. You can sell hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of books to readers all across the globe and delight them and make money while you're doing it. You just have to focus on the things that increase your odds.